how to make gin, how to make whiskey, how to make vodka. Coming to go into a bit more detail, bore you with the science behind it, no problem. I most certainly will bore you with science if you want me to, but I don't want to overload people with information. As I said, ask if you take nothing away, you would get some bit of drink. So I hope you'll be happier leaving the place. If that's okay. Um, so back in the 1840s, this is a working sawmill. So the stonework that was in place about 180 years ago is the spar wall you'll see over the place there. So it listed buildings in Ireland who have to build with the existing infrastructure. That's why this essentially looks like a shed from the outside. So in 2012, Peter, Liam and Oliver, the three gentlemen who purchased this land, if you're familiar with Dublin, there's the Porter House. There's three or four bars in Dublin. There's also one in Camden Street in London and there's also one in New York. So these guys have a craft beer as their background. Their next step then was to make some artisan gin, artisan vodka, and a drop of whiskey. So your easiest spirits to make is your gin and your vodka. Within seven days, they're on your shelves, you're getting money in. Whiskey on the other hand takes three years and one day to mature. So whiskey is a long-term investment. So in 2012, the guys, they had the three stills outside we had our mash, mash tun, and we had three washbacks. We now have five. We had everything set up, but we ran into a bit of a problem, and that problem was we ran out of money. In the middle of an economic crisis, wasn't a good time to be running out of money. So the banks didn't want to lend, um, and we didn't want to take money off Jameson, Diageo, Bushmills. They bought in, they would have a say in your company. So these guys wanted to remain independent. And how we remained independent, as you'll see all those names along the side of the wall, they're the Dingle founding fathers. These are the people who bought empty barrels off us with the promise that we would eventually fill them and give them whiskey in return. So there is some weird wonderful face up there. Um, and as I said, we're very grateful. So after five years, they had three options available to them. So the first option was they could bottle it. So this is our bottle. So if you were a founding father and you bought the jurors, they'll just say founding father and you can label it whatever you want. Um, the second option was you could sell it back to us and make a bit of a profit. Nobody's ever taken option number two. And number three is you can mature it for a bit longer. So there are the three options available to them. And you may have seen some barrels going on to a truck mm -hmm. just as he came in. They were, those founding fathers, they were some of those barrels that were matured here. So some of those guys are going to be bottling theirs in the next maybe two, three, four weeks. Um, so that's the history of this place here. Two, two ingredients, we need two things to make vodka. Water. Water is one. The other thing is ethanol, which is alcohol. There are two things you need to make a vodka. So anything that has sugars, fruit, vegetable, cereal, grain, anything that has sugars, you can ferment, you can distill, obtain your ethanol, cut it back with water, that's vodka. Vodka is the easiest beer to make. There's one key difference between a gin and a vodka. Vodka, as I said, is ethanol and water. A gin is ethanol, water, and you need one botanical, you mentioned it earlier, the yeah, it is the one thing you need to put into a gin to legally call it a gin. So if you have your ethanol and some strawberries or mangoes or whatever it is, it's essentially a flavoured vodka. As long as juniper goes into it, it's a gin. So we make a London dry style gin. So majority of the botanicals we put in is juniper. What we also say the difference is dingle. What we mean by that is what we find growing on the peninsula we're essentially going to experiment with the gin. Um, these are seasonal stuff. Um, we lost the packaging, unfortunately. Um, but in the summer one, or sorry, the spring one, you'll find traces of nettles. In the autumn one, you'll find traces of blackberries. This is the main gin that we produce a lot of it. So if you're coming along the side of the road, you see a red orange kind of flower or plant kind of, that's fuchsia. That's in our main gin. So in the main gin here, you'll obviously have your juniper, which fuchsia, hawthorn, heather, Bog, Martel, Jellica, Cassia, Orange Peel, Lemon Peel. There, there's one or two more, it's probably plenty, I won't give away all the secrets just yet. So, um, there's a lot of local botanicals that we'll put into our gin. Um, but 
Does anyone know the origins of gin? Which country you associate gin with? Well, the Netherlands. Yes. Yes. So, if any of you guys, yeah. Holland. Yes, yes. 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 Dutch. Yeah. Yeah, so, if any of you guys yeah, go to the Netherlands, yeah. this bottle is in the shape of a Yenever bottle. And you're familiar with Yenever, it's a juniper based drink. Um, a lot of people presume it's English because you had King Will or Prince William of Orange, he was the Prince of the Netherlands. His drink was Yenever, juniper based drinking. He later became King William of Orange, King of England, and he brought the concept of it with him to England. He, he became King of England. Um, have you heard of the term Dutch courage? Yeah, okay. Dutch courage came about. King William of Orange, his English soldiers were fighting Spanish soldiers in Antwerp. He gave them alcohol, which was your neighbor, the Dutch based drink, before going into battle, got them a bit drunk, and that's what a term Dutch courage came about. Um, liquid courage, stuff like that. It all kind of derives from the same thing. Um, but in the early 1700s, you had what they called was a gin pandemic in Great Britain, where they estimated every household in Britain drank about half a pint of gin a day. And that half a pint was represented of man, woman, and child. Yes. So it was a lot safer to drink gin and be drunk than to sober up with water, which yeah. is typhoid and cholera. So it was either get drunk and stay drunk or sober up and probably die. So, yeah, again, a very flawed history, <laughs> but again, it's, uh, if you look into it, a different time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of different times. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, now it's essentially, it's quite trendy. Gin, the last maybe eight to 10 years, where you have your fish bowl, your goblet, and you have your gin, your tonic, and people will put in an outrageous amount of fruit. What you're getting with it is orange. So anything citrus, so anything orange, lemon, lime, you're toning down a juniper, you should be tasting your botanicals. Um, for instance, you've got uh, Hendrix. Like Hendrix give you cucumber, similar kind of concept, enhance or tone down certain botanicals. We just feel that orange works best for ours. Um, what you're also getting with it as well as an India style tonic water. Um, in India, you had what was known to the locals as a fever tree. It's called Kinchota something. But on the bark of the fever tree, there was a compound called quinine. Quinine used to cure malaria. It's still kind of used to this day, um, but not widely kind of for malaria. So if any of you are going to Africa in the near future, you can take a bottle of tonic water. It'll help. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the products of the history of the gin and kind of vodka. Like I'll bring you down and I'll explain the gin and the vodka in a bit more detail. But in regarding the history of this place, or gin or vodka, if you ever see single in front of it, it just refers to the one distillery being used. If you see a double or a triple malt or a triple blend, it's tradition in Scotland, it's just two or three distilleries come together to come up with a certain type of whiskey. Malt is 100% malted barley, which is this stuff here. Pot still is malted and unmalted barley. So under English rule, in the 1700s, malted barley was taxed. So the Irish came up with the concept of using malted and unmalted barley. It was essentially a way to cheat tax, and that's how the traditional pot still came about. What we also do with our whiskies is we will marry our whiskies together. What I mean by marrying is you can have something from a white wine. This can be sherry, this can be bourbon. Pull it straight from a cask into a bottle, that's how you marry a whiskey. What you're gonna get is our third single <laughs> Pot still release. So it's a small batch of pot still. It's a marriage of bourbon <coughs> and port. There's only 3,400 bottles of it um, we released.